question. Uh, Jordan has received roughly 65% of the vote in each of the years that he has run. What is your strategy for targeting voters that will get Jordan slash Republican votes below 50%? Well, I don't think I have to go way far out and, uh, you know, announce that both sides are highly, highly polarized. Would anybody disagree with that? Um, so the nature of this district is, uh, and again, don't shoot the messenger here, but uh, the Republicans have done a pretty good job of gerrymandering it. Uh, in order to make sure that uh, they have a firm upper hand in this district. Uh, and that's evidenced uh, in previous elections, uh, obviously not for a lack of good candidates on the Democratic side, uh, but that still turns a result of a two-to-one vote, uh, Republican and Democrat in this district. Now, one of the things about this in a highly polarized environment, uh, there's often an argument about which side libertarians pull people from, um, and if you look at the actual facts of that, we pull equally from both sides. Um, we neither pull more from Republicans nor more from Democrats, although if you ask either side, they have a pretty strong opinion which side we pull people from. Uh, <laughs> but at that point, libertarians have the ability to pull some from the left and some from the right. Uh, and it is absolutely correct that Jim Jordan has a lot of non-fans on the Republican side of things. And certainly a plethora of them on the Democratic side of things. And while I think you can get the left to go to the middle to libertarian, and the right to go to the middle to, to go to libertarian, I don't think you're going to get a lot of Republicans to go all the way to Democrat. It's unfortunate, but that's the environment that we're in. So I would wish that was the case, but I feel it's kind of where we're at. How can Jordan's voting record in Congress be used to convince District 4 voters that you are a better candidate? Let's start with uh, Steve. Um, well, there's a couple different angles you can go with this. Uh, depends on with which arg uh, which group you are talking to. Um, for one, uh, you know, I don't think I have to go into great detail about uh, some of the moral haphazards that uh, Jim Jordan is facing right now. Um, but if you talk to people on the right, which I do, uh, they find very concerning. Uh, on top of that, uh, he signed on to a trillion dollar omnibus bill that's going to be funded on the backs of our grandchildren. Uh, so on that side, you can definitely uh, have that angle that way. Uh, if you want to talk to uh, Democrats and those on the left, there's almost an infinite supply of things that you can say to them. You almost don't have to say them at all. Um, so I would think that uh, there's no shortage of things that you can say to those voters to help win them to your side. But one of the other ones is, again, if we're talking surely a tactical point of view, you know, the numbers are what they are. And again, don't shoot the messenger. I, it had absolutely nothing to do with the gerrymandering side of things. But reality is reality, unfortunately. Thank you, candidates. And here's your next question. Over 300 bipartisan bills, 90% of them are bipartisan, have uh, been passed in the House to help hardworking American families to lower uh, health care costs, protect pensions, address gun violence, and other and others are sitting, and the, uh, they are all sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk in the Senate. If you could pick one of those from the stack, which one would it be, and why? I actually have two. Uh... I'll kind of split my time amongst the both of them. Uh, the first and primary one would be medical marijuana. Um, as we travel around the country, universally, it's very interesting to me that uh, we still throw people in jail for being in their own home uh, with a medicine that just doesn't happen to be have FDA approval, and we throw them in a cell for peacefully sitting inside of the room treating their own pain. Uh, that's unconscionable, and actually the ironic part about that is is as a son of conservative parents uh, who told me, you know, one injection of the marijuanas was going to lead me to, you know, everything else. Um, I find it extremely interesting that now people in my parents' generations are coming to me and asking me about CBD and medical marijuana because they have aches and pains and they're hearing all the good things, the benefits of it, and suddenly they're concerned about whether they can do it legally or not. 
So going along with that, I'd also like to bring up, I guess it's not technical, well, yeah, it uh, made through house stuff too, uh, emigration. Uh, what we have done on our southern border is absolutely unconscionable. I'm wearing a pin on my lapel right now. I was in Deming, New Mexico earlier this year uh, to welcome immigrants that were legal immigrants coming across our border from the south had been granted legal asylum to where our border patrol was dropping them off in the middle of the night at a local McDonald's and saying, have a nice life. Uh, I, I would, we need to do something better than that. Thank you, candidates. Okay, so here's your next question. What personal story do you have that will resonate with voters in the 4th District? And we'll start with Mike. When I was a little girl, I want to make sure that we are we are focusing on those things. So, kind of going along with the uh, you know with a, a unifying message here, I'd like to tell a little story that just happened a few months ago to me. I was actually selling a tractor on Facebook Marketplace, and out of the blue, I get a strange request about, "Hey, would you be willing to rent this tractor?" I'm like, "What?" And here it was a local church that uh, was looking to do a hayride for the opening of their new church. And myself, being an atheist, uh, said, well, what if I bring the tractor and do the hayride for you? You'd be willing to do that? Yeah, I'd be willing to do that. Well, gee, well, we'd be willing to pay you. And I said, I won't accept any payment. And so the message there is there's plenty of good people on this earth that don't agree with you. And so the unifying message there is, is why would I do that? Why would I do that? And the reason I would do that is because values often aren't what you perceive them to be in other people. You don't necessarily understand what motivates other people until you tap into it and you ask them. Now, we get libertarians get accused of self-interest all the time. Well, I can tell you that every act of charity is self-interest. And the reason I did that was because I felt people would benefit from it. That's all there was to it. That's it. And here is your next question. Do you support national referendums? And we'll start with... Is the person that I right had submitted... Uh, oh, to the left, please. To the left. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. All right. All right, at least Mike Ravel's version of Nash referendums is uh, I'll create a fourth branch of government called the people. And what it is is that it starts off with an initiative, just like how you have local referendums, state referendums, where you vote on the issues. It's just like that, but it's on the national level. That, that's, that, that's, it, that's it in a nutshell. Thank, thank you. Okay, so I would say I would agree with most of the other sentiment up here. I would also add that uh, one of the things that uh, I find concerning about referendums, at least as they exist right now, is uh, how some of them are worded in their titles. It's almost a guarantee. It's almost a guarantee that whatever the title of the referendum is, it means the opposite, the exact opposite of what it says. It doesn't matter which side it comes from. It's, it's almost a, uh, has been, become a matter of deceit. Uh, rather than a matter of principle on, on those referendums. Now, that's not a problem with the referendum process, the process itself, um, but just pointing that out there. But again, I, I agree with the, uh, the other members of the panel here that, uh, uh, that in general, we do have a way of instituting such things uh, through the Constitution. We've been given the ability to do that. Um, but that being said, uh, if when I look at the mess of what referendums can be at the state level, I almost shudder to think of what they could become at the national level. Okay, just getting my bearings here. <laughs> okay, I have a feeling this is going to be a real quick uh, round. Um, have you taken any large contributions from special interests? Uh, short answer is no. I'm a proud thousand heir. Uh, <laughs> and I would just like to point out, uh, it probably will be a very quick question, but... Uh, the Libertarian Party, uh, I'll ask yourself the other parties this way, the Libertarian Party actually completely excludes the corporate donations to our party. Uh, as far as I know, we're the only party that does that. Uh, I will not take any corporate donations uh, this round. 
Um, so that's kind of one of those things, and you can hold me to that because I don't really plan on there being any. Um, but uh, I would turn them down if they did come that way, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so if you are elected, will you promise to have a diver have diversity in your staff? And we'll start with Steve. All right, now uh, for the grand total of four people that I have, I've already got one uh, uh, LGBT person. I've also got uh, my rock star on my campaign is actually uh, uh, one of our female libertarian volunteers and uh, growing daily on that. A um, bit too early to know as far as what that demographic makeup is. I wish that I had the ability to be choosy on those things. Um, if I've got enough people to be choosy, I would absolutely make it as diverse as possible, and that's pretty easy with libertarians because we're a very, very diverse group to begin with. Uh, so I would just leave it at that. What is your position on war with Iran, and do you think that the president would be able to initiate hostilities without authorization from Congress? What is your position on war with Iran, and do you think that the president would be able to initiate hostilities without authorization from Congress? And we're starting. I wish I had a half hour on this topic. So libertarianism, before it is a political party, is a philosophy, and one of the key tenets of libertarianism is the non-aggression principle. And that is that the only justified use of force is the repulsion of force that's initiated against you. So when it comes to being anti-war, that's very much a libertarian stance. So first off, Soleimani was at least not able to be articulated by the administration of any imminent threat. And that's particularly concerning. Um, I just want to point out that my personal feeling is is that the president should be the general of the first battalion into war, which should be the United States Congress. Because if it was a war worth fighting, then there should be no opposition to them signing up to do it. But it's never them that go. So that by itself is uh, definitely where I stand on that particular issue. As far as Iran itself, I'd also like to point out, this is an argument that I can make to the right-hand side of the uh, argument, which is, if Iran had a troop plane full of paratroopers that flew over Iowa and paratrooped in to supposedly stabilize the region, I would just like to ask what you think their life expectancy would be, regardless of whether of what reason they said they would be there or not. And I would just leave it at that. Or we need to bring all of our troops home. There's no reason for us to be in these engagements. They're not making us safer, and it's not about our freedom. Its next question is, what kind of health care plan do you support? Medicare for all, or what, and why? Uh, since we started off talking about the, uh, uh, about the ACA, I just want to point out that if you are uh, down on your luck enough that you can't afford to make your mandatory ACA payment, uh, you receive a fine. That seems counterproductive. Um, but anyway, uh, libertarians are going to be against the ACA because of force to buy a product. Um, universal health care is, I think, a, a laudable goal for anybody, and I don't know of anybody that would be against everyone's health being protected. The question is how you do it. And uh, I'm open to all ideas on that, but I didn't, again, I just want to point out that using the welfare model, you're talking about a seven to one ratio of waste as far as what actually gets down to the bottom by the time it's all done. Government's inefficient. I mean, that's the bottom line. I wish it weren't the way. I'm not overtly against government just because it's government. But it has to work at the end of the day. It's not enough to just say we want to do these things. It matters whether it actually hits the ground and whether it actually accomplishes the goals that you're trying to achieve. And I don't think the ACA did that for a minute. Okay, so I do want to point out uh, that uh, there are other ideas out there. I'm open to them. If they're government, they're government. If they're not, they're not. Um, but I think that uh, you know, mutual insurance is not exactly a new idea. We're running out of time, so this is going to be the last question. 
What is your plan to improve ac access to quality education and make college more affordable? Education, obviously, an issue near and dear to my heart as well. I'm a 25-year educator. I've taught high school. I've taught uh, private college. And I'm currently, after this debate, hightailing it to Virginia to teach a class at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in Richmond. So I've got a little bit of a drive ahead of me. It's going to be a long evening. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to point out um, that first off, uh, you know, I had college loans too. I paid them off. Uh, I still remember the video that I scoffed at when I took out those loans. It was a video that I had to watch that emphatically told you that you must pay them back. Um, you know, I understand the difficulty in paying those back, but and I am absolutely in for uh, in favor of why does our government charge our students interest? Uh, that's the one I don't get. I mean, you can certainly you know provide the financial vehicle without penalizing them with interest. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. But I'm also firmly, uh, obviously, as an automotive uh, uh, instructor, I'm all for trades. Uh, you know, I was told the entire time I was growing up, you won't be anything unless you went to college. And now what we have is an absolute stark shortage of people in trades that it can come right out of school and not have to take on those obligations to make a good living for themselves. And so I would like to encourage us to uh, look at those other options as well because of efficiency. To go to the closing statements now so each candidate will have an opportunity to say, what their website is or anything that you didn't get a chance to say and we'll start with Steve. Okay, again, my name is Steve Perkins, Libertarian candidate for District 4. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, Facebook right now and my, my web page is actually current, uh, currently under construction. We're doing a revamp of it, but everything is branded under Perkins for Ohio. So if you search for Perkins for Ohio, I've got a, a bio on Ballopedia as well. Uh, you can check that out as, as you will. Um, but I do want to point out that obviously education is very important to me uh, as a career educator. But I am actually in a private sector uh, entity where I can be fired after any class. And that's the way I like it. Because either I perform or I don't. I either get results or I don't. As an automotive technician, you either fix the car or you don't. So it's about results. We all have, many of us, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter, across the scale, have the same intents. The bottom line is how do we get to the results? And simply voting our intents does not get us those results. I would like to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate Janet and uh, the Jordan Watch uh, and you know, the Democrats for agreeing to have people who normally wouldn't be on this stage up here. Uh, it says a lot. One of my campaign slogans is step out of line because nothing changes until you do. So thank you.